into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. John Copenhaver, he's back from his big worldwide tour. <laughs> oh, am I? <laughs> <laughs> the, tour, the tour of the, the, the VCU classrooms, maybe? <laughs> well, it, it doesn't matter really where it is. It's just it's you're out and about. How's that? It's Maybe. just the world in my head, is that what it is? <laughs> yeah, the world in your mind. So uh, today's going to be another good show. It's been a, November's a pretty heavy month always. I guess a lot of books yeah, come out right. and a lot of good people and stuff like that. So I've, I've been watching old TJ Hooker reruns all day just to get warmed up. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I have to get ready for the for this, you know, mysteries and all these things. I'm, I'm super ready. So, uh, so we've got uh, an author with a new book. Odyssey's End. It's the Rick Cahill series. It's book 10. So, Mr. Matt Coyle, thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Wow. So, you've, you've been around. You're, you've kind of got a few books out and you're sort of doing well and stuff. And I noticed in, in one of the bio things I, I, I read that uh, your father gave you uh, The Simple Art of Murder by Raymond Chandler when you were 14. So, what do you think he was trying to say to you? Uh, probably just like, get me back in my room, quit messing around. Um, <laughs> my, it's funny. My my dad was quite a reader, and actually, I'll, I'll pop this out right away. His aunt, my great aunt, was Mary Chase, who wrote the play Harvey about the six foot invisible rabbit that was made into a movie with with uh, Jimmy Stewart. Uh, so the the writing's kind of been in the it's in the family blood. My mother's uh, grandmother wrote on her own. She wrote a little book of poetry and um, it was kind of in the blood. My brother was a really good writer and during uh, for different kind of business. But um, yeah, it's, it's been in the fan, it's been in the blood. Um, I was, I think I was already probably reading it. I know I was already reading Agatha Christie by then and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. But once I read Chandler, you know, I was four, I was 14 ish, like you said. And, you know, I was kind of a rebel in my own cause um, or without a cause more appropriately. And so the idea of, because when you're reading Agatha Christie, wonderful storyteller, wonderful puzzle maker, and the same with Conan Doyle, is you're getting, it's definitive, good guys, bad guys, solve the case. And I started reading Chandler, and like, wait, wait a second, there's some gray in here. A um, good guy doesn't necessarily always win. And that really, uh, that appealed to me at that age, that rebellious age. And it kind of stuck all these years later. Yeah, it's interesting how that is. The, the gray character, you know, that uh, when you get into a kind of classic mystery noir like that, how so many of the characters, and not everybody in the in the book or the story, is not all all good. You know, there's there's some evil mixed in with everyone, and it kind of displays that. Right. That's that's uh, what I love about it, definitely. And uh, it, ch- it changed my life. I would say getting that book for my dad. So now, when you're in a position like that, like you said, you know, with a lot of writing in the blood and in the family and stuff, did it uh, make you self-conscious about what you were going to write and how you were going to write it and what people thought about it, even within your family? Uh, of course, being of Irish descent, there's the initial uh, insecurity, but of so whatever caring what any everybody thinks. But honestly, I don't even th- at that age. I guess I had met Mary Chase, but I. I think I met her when I was younger. I didn't know what any of that meant at the time. Um, so I don't think I had any, I have to raise it to a certain level. It's just as I got older, I, I started developing my own levels of what I thought where the book should be. But honestly, I didn't write for, I didn't be, be really dedicated to writing for so many years. I didn't start writing seriously until I was, I think I, think I was 43. Um, you know, I would dabble here and there, got a degree in English, which was a really good prerequisite for getting a job in the restaurant business, which is what I did when I got out of college. 
uh, you know, you can wash dishes with that English degree. Once I started writing years later, um, I just kind of had my own level I thought I needed to get to. So now this is book 10 yeah. in, in the series. How do you keep something like this going and keep it interesting, fresh, and keep people wanting to read what's going on with your character, Rick Cahill? Yeah, well, I, I, I hope I'm able to do that. Uh, yeah, it is, it's in first person, too. So ten books, one guy's had the whole time. You certainly don't want to bore people. But what I start with for every book is what is, of course, I have a, I have the through line. I've got the main plot, and there's this nebulous ending out there. I can sort of see through the fog. I just have to have a target to aim for. Uh, but what I really am concentrating initially on is the, the major subplot for Rick. What is going on in his life where taking a particular case or any case will make it more difficult and kind of vice versa, what's going on in his life will make his investigation more difficult. So once I nail down, and it's not, Rick's got a lot of situations going, so uh, once I nail down that um, that subplot, I kind of go from there, and, I, and strangely, the plot grows from the character's responses. It's kind of the backwards way of doing it, but I'm always uh, flabbergasted and happy when some reviewer says, well, plotted, because if they ever saw the sausages make, they'd go, what? what's going on there? Well, it's really interesting um, because your character, uh, Rick Hill, has a fatal brain disorder, um, CTE. Yeah. You think of that, what... You know, what a, de- a de- detective character needs is the sort of mental acuity to put together all these sort of uh, different elements. And I, I'm just fascinated. It's really original, really fascinating choice. I'd love to know more why you chose that, uh, how you came about it, and then how you work with presenting it on the page. Yeah, I think I think my publisher probably thinks why well, I came, how I came about it is because I'm stupid. But giving my <laughs> giving, giving my somewhat successful series character lead character a potentially fatal disease, uh, I had two rules when I first started writing, and I, it took me ten years to get published. Ten years from initial starting writing and, and finally getting an okay from an agent, and then quickly after that a publisher. But really, probably five or six years of sending out and reject getting rejections from agents. So. I was writing for 10 years before this thing got published. I've been writing with Rick for 20 years. And I had one, two rules. And one was that he could not have a sidekick that was physically imposing, um, kind of a comedic uh, release, or wealthy enough to get him out of any situation. And so I wanted him to be a lone wolf and with no one to really fall back on. And Luckily, by accident, I introduced Moira McFarlane in, in the second book, uh, Night Tremors, and that's, I don't think I'd still be writing the series if it wasn't for introducing her to kind of show, lighten Rick up a little bit, show that somebody very competent cared about him. Um, but anyway, and the other one was every, every mistake he's made, physical and emotional, all the scars, they stay, they're, they're there. And I started to think, I think I introduced it in my, I'm looking back at my bookshelf, my eighth book, Last Redemption, this idea of the CTE. Because Rick, he, he boxed as a, uh, his backstory is he boxed as a teen, probably for three years. He played football all the way from Pop Warner through two years of college ball. And he was a cop, rough and tumble. And plus, as a private investigator, by that time, he probably had, I don't know, at least three concussions. So I started to think, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to stick to this thing that everything matters and there, you can't, you can't escape the bad decisions or, or the, or the physicalness of his life. I thought, well, he's probably got CTE. It's, it, as you guys probably know, it's not something that can be definitively um, diagnosed until after death so far, but every football player they've looked, looked for that has passed away and they've looked for it has had it. And I think there's a lot of people walking around now that probably have it. Um, so I thought, well, I kind of, I'm going to stick to this. I'm going to give it to him and then try to figure it out. And it certainly for the first book, it, it was a wonderful, dramatic situation. But to be true, I can't just say, well, at the end of book two, book uh, eight, it went away, you know. Um, so he still got it. <laughs> He's dealing with it. 
uh, it's get it, your your um, very uh, bright um, thought of you know he's got to think he's got to think of things he, he has to be cognitively able and in this book he's had some other situations in other book but in this book he's starting to question himself a little bit about his cognitive ability and his memory and situations. So he feels like it's creeping on him, um, but he's still pretty physically capable. He's always had quite a few, quite a few uh, scars. I think he's about 43 in this book, and he's he's trying to deal with it but as well as put his family back together, which is kind of stemmed, the, the breakup kind of stemmed with, from some of the, well, first his own just bullheadedness, but one of the um the uh, symptoms that was shown in the last book this kind of irrational rage that can flash at any moment which is can be a symptom of cte it's interesting because it, you know i think there's a, a long history of detective figures who have to struggle with some sort of oftentimes their own you know sense of morality or psychological health you, you don't read too much about dealing or struggling with physical health, or in this case, what amounts to sort of a combination of the two, because um, they aren't always easily dividable. And, uh, you know, I, I was curious if this sort of is moving to the realm of unreliable narration and that kind of thing. Um, and you mentioned a little bit about trouble with memory, and I don't know if you've uh, continued to explore that idea or will continue to explore that idea, but what do you think? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting thought. And, and Rick has kind of been somewhat of an unreliable narrator throughout. Just that, not to fool the reader or anything like that, but just that he'll make wrong, incorrect assumptions at times. And sometimes the reader can kind of see he's, he's, he's not making the right choice, but other times they can't. So he's, he's always had this, well, this kind of zeal to find the truth. Um, his father, it's almost in every book. I think it's in every book where he's, he lives by the code handed down to him by his father. Um, sometimes you have to do what's right, even when the law says it's wrong. And he's got this, and his backstory is that his wife was murdered, uh, and he was accused of it way back when, but he's, he felt responsible for it, whether he did it or not, throughout. So now he's just he's always striving for redemption and for the need to um, find the truth. And... That's all. That's been this kind of straight, straight ahead, quickest way to find the truth. And he does kind of miss some nuances at times. And yeah, I would think the as the series, whatever the the, the may come with the series, that would, that's certainly something to delve deeper into. Kind of something bubbling in my head right now. Uh, somebody asked me to write a short story in, in the near future, and I kind of have an idea about that. So your characters and and your main character in this. Uh, Cahill, how do you experience that character while you're writing? Do you hear dialogue? Do you see it like a movie? Um, what's your relationship like with your characters? Yeah, he's, like I said, it's, it took me a long time to get published, and I've been writing in first person all these 20 plus years, so he's been in my head, or I've been in his head for, for 20 years or more, so I just, is kind of a feeling when I, when I'm writing, um, I'm not going to say it's, you know, I'm, I'm him, but I just feel where he's, I do feel that I'm inside his head. So I, I know how he'll react to certain situations regarding, you know, I mean, I, I put him in some really horrible emotional and horrible physical situations that thank God I haven't been in. But, you know, I'm of a certain age where I've lost family members and that's real, real emotion, real grief. And I think every writer tries to take, because I don't think, you know, I mean, I don't think Lee uh, Child has had an exciting life as Jack Reacher. Uh, maybe Jack Cars has an exciting life as uh, Reeves. I'm blank on his protagonist name. So you, you take the real emotion you've had in certain, certain circumstance, situation rather, and try to weave it into the fictional story you're telling. I've never had a friend die in front of me, but I've lost, like I said, members of the family and been around for the end of both my parents um, passing. So try to find that real emotion and stick it into an unreal situation. Um, but regarding Rick and even Moira, who I've been writing now for 10 years, I, I, I just feel after, even though she's in third person, Rick's in first person, 
just having written them for so long, I do feel that they're, you know, they're all inside me and, I do. This is what she. This is you know. This is Rick does something stupid, and this is how she, this is how she'll react. So it's. I can't say it's a movie. It's kind of a feel. I'm kind of feeling it. Um, I might see a little bit as I'm typing. I really don't. Honestly, I can't see Rick's face because I don't know what he looks like because I'm always looking out. Um, I have his general uh, statistics. Uh, you know, height and weight and brown and brown and all that and fit, but. I don't really, when I write him, I don't see his face. I see, I might, I might see Moira's face or some point, or, or maybe Turk Muldoon's face, but I really don't know what Rick facially looks like. I know he's better looking than I am, and that's a given. <laughs> oh, that's not possible. Well, that's true, too. <laughs> um, when, you, when you write a story, um, how does it come to you? Do you have kind of a, a thought of, uh, is there a subtext or some sort of meaning or something you want people to get out of each book? Or is it pure entertainment and it's just about, you know, Rick and what he goes through or the challenges? Yeah, I don't think I start with a uh, something I'm trying to convey to the, the readers specifically. But I think as a story develops, there, that might come about. I, I, more and more I realize that I'm writing about family when it was never my um, – I never th- – well, maybe maybe this last book is something I concentrated on beforehand, but I don't really think about it. Before I'm writing it, like I mentioned, I've got the the target out there. I know who the bad guys are and basically what they've done, and how I got to, I got to, how I have to get to them at the end. But and also Rick's major subplot. But I don't know the the greater theme. I don't think I'm a theme writer, but th- themes do come about probably through subconscious. And I would say probably half the books, probably the last half, is it is about family which is kind of interesting to me, and maybe it's because I'm not a parent. I don't have any children. Um, I mean, I've got nieces and nephews and all that. I've got grand nieces and nephews now. Um, but I, probably some empty emptiness in my life that I'm, I'm trying to fill subconsciously. And now that I take a step back and look, I see that quite a bit. I'm writing about family. That's really interesting. I, um, I, of course, you know, in looking at your bio and, I've noticed that you've and been present for some of the awards you've won or been nominated for, quite a impressive list. And um, I'm going to ask a, a question that uh, was asked of me because I did a presentation for Sisters of Crime a while ago about how to write an award-winning story. <laughs> Do you have any advice? What is an award-winning story? Um, I'm still trying to crack the nut on this one. I don't have an answer. <laughs> so you, what, what, what do you think? I mean, um, what, what, what needs to be part of an award-winning story? I, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like you, I don't know. Um, I, I will say that and I'm very grateful for the nominations and awards. And I feel, you know, I'm proud of my work. But I do think that my first book won, it won the San Diego Book Award, but it also won the Anthony, which is the mis- kind of a big mystery award for best first. And I think that really helped make me, make me more visible for potential awards. Um, I can't say it may be a bestseller or anything like that, but, I just, I think in the, the community, it made me more visible. Plus, I, and this, honestly, <laughs> some awards are conference awards where you may not have been, I'm not trying to downplay it, I'm very happy for the awards, but you may not, people may not have read the book, but, um, they, you know, you're not, you get nominated, and I've been in the, at, at the game for a while, and I, I'm part of the community, and I, we're all friends, and I think that helps you get noticed. Um, but there's, of course, there's other words where you, you know, people actually read your book and then they decide. But I just think writing, honestly, I think it's writing what you want to write and just being true to your characters. I don't think I picked the most um, visible and popular subgenre of mystery to write. Hard boiled PI basically is what I'm writing. And you think, he, I mean, you think you go back to Chandler and McDonald and, and Hammett, which is all, they're all great, but. That's a million years ago. Um, there, yeah, and there's, there's Reed Frail Coleman, a tremendous PI writer. Doesn't really write him anymore, but so it's not the most, it's not the most visible or popular genre. But I, I just think that being true and not, not, you know, I'll say this, not being afraid to fail, taking chances. I gave Rick a fatal disease. I actually had, 
there was a book where he lost his eyesight, and the, the, the possibility of regaining his eyesight was always there. I, I talked to ophthalmologists and told them what the situation I was looking at, and they said, yeah, this, this could possibly happen. And then when the swelling went down, I can't remember the medical term, but the, the piece of the brain that if it, when the swelling went down, the eyesight could come back. But I, I wrote a book, Blind Vigil, where my PI, I'm writing a first person PI, and the guy's blind, and, and how do I make that exciting? Um, so I, I really pushed myself. So I think ta- I think taking chances, not being af- well, I am afraid to fail, but just doing it anyway. I think that's maybe helped you. I don't, you know, there are people that can chase markets, and I, I can't. And I'm I'm currently writing something different, and I'm kind of scared about how it's all going to turn out because I'm still not writing the the big um, fast paced thrillers. But for me to dig in, to be able to dig into the story, I have to write what I want to read and what I feel. So I really think just being true to what you to what you feel and what you believe. And, you know, I'm working on craft, clearly, and being a part of the community. I think that helps for potential awards or nominations. Yeah, absolutely. I think I wholeheartedly agree with with you on all those points. Um, It's just such an abstract question. Sorry I asked it. No, no, no. I think it's it's a good question. It makes you think. No, I think it's a good question. So speaking of, you're working on something new. Uh, I mean, I I don't know to the degree you feel comfortable talking about it, but maybe just talking about what it means to be working on something new or moving in a different direction. Um, I'd be very interested to hear about that. Yeah, well, it's scary as hell. Like I said, I've been writing writing first person in one guy's head for – 20 years. I mean, Rick does feel like a member of the family to me. And when I consider not writing him um, for a short period or for ne- never writing him again, it, it does strike me emotionally. Um, so I'm what I'm working on right now is in third person. I'm, I'm going to go, the theory so far is multiple points of view, a male and a female point of view. The idea I really like, I haven't found the perfect story for it yet, but it's, uh, I mean, it's a little, got a little bit of Rick to it. It's a former cop who has to leave the force um, under not great conditions. There's only one other person that knows why he had to leave, but everyone else thinks, you know, he didn't do anything wrong. But And his father was a cop for him. His father's ill, and he's helping pay medical expenses. Not everything's covered by um, private health and, med- and Medicare. And he he's a PI, but he's not terribly successful. So he gets the opportunity to moonlight for some un- unknown a period of time not thought to be very long for a, for a um, the public defender's office and he's a true believer he's a he's a thin blue line true believer and to, to work to work for the other team is very troublesome to him but really the money's better for what he's currently making and he can't really turn the opportunity down and he the the the, the PD public defender he works with is a true believer on the other side and there's gonna there'll probably be a little romance there, even though. Um, but beyond that, he when he goes and visits his father, his father's like, well, you, you know, he, he's chastising him for being on the other side. And so I'm dealing with those uh, dynamics, and then I'm I'm inching my way to finding what I think is the perfect story to kind of bring it all about. You know, when you say that Rick Cahill is like um, family, like you you. You know he's he, he's part of you in a sense and all that stuff. So when you put um, him through all of these different things, like in the ten books up to now, and you go th- and you kind of live through that whole situation that you've uh, given him, that you've written him into, w- with all of that happening at the end of it, when you look back, how do you think going through each of these situations with him uh, changes you? That's a good question. I think it. I think it makes you. I think it makes you think and how your life is in relation to some fictional character, but how you're experiencing it. Are you being true to your own um, goals? Are you really living life to its fullest? Yeah, I I think about it. Um, I see mistakes that he makes that probably I've made as well. So, yeah, I I, um, there have been times when I've I've been really sorry for the guy. Um, There's been times when I've been sorry for myself, too, but that is less much less effective for uh, moving forward. But, um, no, I, I I see the – I think we're always trying to work something out when we write um, consciously or subconsciously. And I, I think 
I think maybe writing so much about family, and it's not, I'm not writing, people think I'm, this is some, um, slow slog. It's not about, but family is important to Rick and, and it, it drives him specifically in this book. What he's doing, it's really all about family, but it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a hard knock book. So I think that it has made me kind of understand what's, what I'm going through and try to hold things together. My books tend to be a little melancholy. can be. There's, you know, a, a happy ending, I think, is when Rick got shot in the face, but he got the girl. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there's a little, there can be a little under undertone uh, of melancholy. And I never understood that. My life's been pretty easy. Uh, but we did lose... We did lose my, my mother would have been my, our, our first grandkid, my mother's first grandchild, um, the, the week before his 16th birthday, a freak accident and a car crash. Somebody else was driving a completely freak accident and she died. And I was, I was, um, 32 because I remember she was born when I was 16. So she was just, and, and I think that is, it's always, it was hard for, you know, I mean, it damn near destroyed my brother-in-law and my sister. But they fought back and battled through it. But I, um, I just think that it's affected us all deeply. Sometimes it bubbles up even now. And it's been 30 years or more. It bubbles up. And I think that's what I'm trying to work out. I don't think I've gotten this deep in a conversation before, but I think that's what I'm, I think that's where the, uh, the melancholy is something I'm kind of trying to work through the emotions. It's something that still, uh, bo- you know, you've lost it, you know, someone, not my child, but certainly someone very important in our entire family. And I think, I think the entire family has always had to work through that. Right. It's, it's, it's something that stays with you. Yeah. Just, you just kind of move around it and uh, try to build off of it. It's, it's hard. It's a really hard thing. And it's, uh, but it's going to be um, even harder in a sense, like you're working it out. It's kind of therapeutic in a way, writing a, a book. Um, but sharing that with such a, judgmental public <laughs> and uh especially lately you know with social media and yeah. all that there's everybody and their dog can can say anything about you any time now and it's kind of a lot more uh direct than it ever used to be and i i, I wonder if that does do you think about the reader then when you're writing something like this yeah i think about the reader because because the they are my people. They've, uh, they're investing their time and money and emotion in, in what I do. I'm, I'm talking about my diehard readers. I'm not talking about my two star review on Goodreads. I'm not trying, I'm not denigrating them. And sometimes I'm, I read all my reviews, which doesn't help with the, what you just mentioned. It's kind of stupid no, to do. It's the worst thing. Yeah. <laughs> but I, actually, there are times when I'll, so I'll find someone's got a good point. Um, but yes, I am writing for my readers, but I'm also, I'm, I'm writing, I'm writing Rick's story and they're along for the ride and they trust me to make the good and bad decisions for him. So yes, I do, I do have readers in mind and because it's first person and because the thing I mentioned earlier is that I had the rule that I didn't break, which is everything carries, everything carries over the bad decisions. You can't avoid them. So those can, those can go from book to book. And so when the readers are foremost in my mind is when I'm trying to straddle the line of giving enough backstory for new, for new readers. And so enough backstory for them to understand some of this, the decisions Rick makes, but not too much where they don't, if they like the book, they don't, you know, they know enough about it where they have, they won't, don't have to go back and buy one through nine. Um, and then the other thing is I don't want to bore my existing readers. And I, when I wrote, um, Lost Tomorrows, which was my, I'm looking up on my stack. I think it was my fifth book, sixth book, sixth book. That was the one where Rick um, learns this, the truth about what happened to his wife. And when I was writing that, I just said, you know, I, I, I can only write this for my existing readers. If, if new readers come across this and they kind of don't know where they are, I can't, I can only do it one way. And I did that and, you know, I'm still trying the best I can to bring everybody in. But honestly, I think it was I won the um, I won the Seamus for it and the Lefty Award and just not you know not just thinking only about my existing readers. So maybe there was a lesson there. I don't know. Like we were talking about earlier about um, 
awards. There's kind of a, who knows how it works, but so I do think I do think about my existing readers. I'm so I'm so thankful to have them. Years ago, when I was writing in the dark and didn't have an agent, didn't have hope for an agent or anything, I thought maybe you know wouldn't it be cool? Because I have favorite authors. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite authors is Michael Connolly, who I have the extreme pleasure of interviewing him tonight down here in Coronado, San Diego. And I thought, you know, because when books come out, I drive, I drive everything. I'm buying the book. I'm reading it. I'm sorry if I have to read for a blurb. I have to read Connolly first, same with Chris and, and T. Jefferson Parker. But I thought, man, wouldn't it be cool if I ever wrote a book, wrote books, and people, I, I they wanted to get my book ahead of everything else. And there aren't 100,000 of those fans, but there's some. And I'm blessed and amazed and so grateful for it. So violence. Uh, this is, uh, you know, a mystery crime book. So how do you, how do you deal with violence and how you write it on the page and how much of it and how much of it you talk about. Yeah, that's something I do think about and not because I'm afraid of offending people, but just, you know, I, I, I don't, there was one where there was, I needed to have a signature, something signature serial criminals signature at a crime scene. And because it's because I write in first person, I don't show not all the violence is the aftermath of the violence you see. There's quite a bit of violence in Rick's life and you see that, but it's aftermath that generally that you see. And it was something that I really questioned whether I was going to do it or not, because I did not want to um, use death cavalierly and defame a, a body. But I sort of, yeah, I got I have to do this. The, the, there has, the signature has to be left behind, and it has to be something unusual that no one could replicate on their own. It's, you know, because I'm sure there's a lot of kinky, weird stuff out there that you won't, you'll see more than once that probably homicide cops have seen. So this one had to be kind of different. And I really, I actually warned um, when I would do some book events, I would warn people about it because I felt very iffy about it. So. I do take violence into consideration, but this book is probably the most violent book I've written. But it, and I try, I just try not to make it gratuitous. I try to, it try, it has to have, um, significance. There has to be a reason for it. It's just not to have another dead body. Of course, when you're writing, uh, mystery, I think when I first started mis writing mysteries, the, the rule was sort of you had to have a dead body in the first 50 pages. And quite often, quite often I don't. The body comes later and then there might be multiple bodies and there might be multiple scars for Rick. But, I'm not, I, I've not thought, you know, I've, I've ne never thought about writing a heist book or something like that. That takes a lot of uh, brain power. But I, violence is a part of the genre. I try not to make it gratuitous, but it does play an important part, and it plays an important, it's brought Rick to where he is now with this, this CTE. So I don't avoid it, but I try not to make it gratuitous. That was kind of a long way of now, I'm really interested in something you just said about structure. I'm uh, a teacher and a professor at VCU. I you know, teach creative writing classes. And, you know, there is sort of this a compulsion among my students to put the body on the first page or something akin to it. And you mentioned in, in your books that that's not necessarily always the case and that, that change. And I'd love to know more about why. Um, you, you think you write that way, perhaps it's connection to character development or storytelling? Yeah, I think it, I think it really does. It is about um, connection to character and storytelling. I understand the, the desire to have the early body, and I, it's not, not every, I'm pretty sure I've had bodies early, but probably only about half of them. But because you've got to hook the reader, you've got to be able to, and that's, that's the reality. You have maybe, I don't know, what is it, um, maybe 10 pages or something, or maybe, you know, if someone's standing at a, a Barnes & Noble picking up your book because they like the cover or they like the spine, in my case. My covers aren't out that much. <laughs> I like the spine. Um, you've got to be able to hook the reader without being, without, while still being true to your character and true to the book you're writing. So, for me, I try to make the character interesting or the situation interesting. If I don't need a, if I don't need a dead body early, I don't put it there. I try to have uh, something compelling. I try to have, I honestly try to have change and tension on, on almost every page. Change is not always easy on every page, but tension, I, 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 and, it, and a lot of the tension, I, I'm always happy when people say it was a fast read, and I'm thinking, I didn't really have that much violence in that book. But I think a lot of the tension is internal, and of course I have a cheat because I'm writing in first person. So 
you know, internal tension can pull your reader in too and can feel for fast pacing. So uh, for me, character always comes first. Um, I know that it's not always that. Everyone likes this. A lot of people like to say that. And then I, I was interviewing a really good writer over the weekend who kind of said, well, I don't, I don't always think that way. They kind of meld together and I get that, the character in the plot. He writes kind of real, real thrillers. But I think that I just don't want to, my, I don't write books where there's 40 bodies early. And maybe this one has more bodies than ever. <laughs> Not 40. <laughs> I get it. And, you know, I throw the body out there on the first draft. But for me, revision, revision, revision. So that's, I, I nail it down, try to get down to the, the meat of the story. But, I try to, I always think about what's going on, like I said, what's going on in Rick's life. And hopefully, even for new readers, you know, if they're being introduced to a character with chronic traumatic encephalopathy, because that, that has been in the first chapter of the last three books, I'm pretty sure. So that is, that in itself can be interesting. And then him having to deal with something that, with that on top of it. But I have no objection to reading a books that have early bodies. Um, hell, there's a lot of great ones out there. Yeah, it's interesting because I think it's uh, certainly, you know, students want the, they want sort of direction. <laughs> and when you're teaching, it's always like, well, um, you know, there's not always endeavor statements that I, you can make in, in writing. And I think sort of what you're talking about reflects that. Um, yeah, well, I would say, God bless you for doing what you're doing. I cannot, I could not teach. So honestly, I, I think it's a real skill. The, my writing process is so messed up that I couldn't teach it. I wouldn't teach it, but I also don't know how to write any other way. I've tried other ways. So, you know, I, I took a lot of writing classes when I was uh, first began writing for sure. But so anybody that can really, you know, illuminate people to how um, kind of the, the path, um, I give a lot of credit to. I'm not so sure I'm always that illuminating, um, but I, you know, I think it's always great to hear writers talk about, you know, how they go about things. And, and you mentioned, you know, that you're, you're kind of me a messy drafter, I guess. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it's, it's pretty bad. Yeah. Well, talk, talk a little bit about that process. Clearly, it feels like you have to get comfortable with, I guess, the mess of it. But how do you how do you do that? <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, I'll get the mop out, so there'll be some cleanup afterwards. <laughs> the puke uh, draft. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't, I've tried to outline, I don't outline, but as I mentioned earlier, I do have a um, very skeletal in my mind where I, I know who the bad guys are generally, and I know what they want, and I know, I may not know exactly who's going to die, but I will as I go. And then I've got the subplot, but uh, I mentioned I took writing classes, and, and the woman I took them from, his name is Carolyn Wheat, a mystery writer, uh, awarded mystery writer, and a great teacher. She's not teaching anymore. But she would, and I, I, and I was in, thankfully, I, I got into her writer's group later on after being another writer's group. And she really, without her, I would not be published. She said, you know, Matt, your subconscious is a much better writer than you are. <laughs> so, and how that comes about is very messy, is I'll be writing, kind of moseying along, have an idea where I'm going. And then something will drop into my mind. I'll, I'll put a sentence in that I'm not exactly sure what it means, a sentence, what have you. It could be a paragraph. It could be just one piece of dialogue from someone. I don't really know what it means yet, and I leave it in as I'm going through. I call it dropping anchors. And as I'm going along, I would say 70% of the time, I'll understand pretty quickly what, what my subconscious was trying to tell me the book is really about, because I do believe that. And so it's a benefit. Sometimes it takes longer. Um, sometimes the the ratio is not that good. So I drop these anchors, and then I stumbling my way through. I tell there's a great John Lesquois, who I'm sure you know and have read. I heard him at a conference one time. He said, "I allow my I allow my first draft to be crap," and uh, I really uh, that really struck a note with me. And I do the same. I figure that since I don't outline, I'm really kind of writing an outline in that first draft. So I let all sorts of stuff in. If my um, imagination takes me someplace, I will actually write. As I'm writing, I know the chapter or at least the scene or two I'm writing is not going to make the final version. But I know I, I have to write through it to get to where I want to go. I try, like I said, you would never teach this. I try not to think when I'm writing. I just try to feel along, kind of bump, bump along. And... 
I have to let my imagination fill in these gaps, go down these um, dead end streets, and then when I finish that first draft, and I'm all as I'm going along, I'm feeling like this is crap, this is terrible. They're they're finally going to find out that I'm a hack. You know, it took nine books, but number ten is going to let them know I'm I'm a hack. I don't know what I'm doing. And then uh, on my first read through, I go, hey, you know, that's not that bad. It's not very good, but it's not that bad. And then I'll go through and I'll take out about, I've taken out 30,000 words on the first pass before. And of course I'm adding as I'm going. So like I said, very inefficient, but, and, and so I will probably revise after the first draft before I turn it in six to seven times, I would say. And some are very quick, but it could be less, but, um, that's the way it works for me. The story, I'm able to get a better sense of what I'm trying to say as I go through. Like I said, you you would never teach this in your classes, but I fought against it. Somewhere in the middle of my career, I thought, you know what? I can't do this anymore. This doesn't make any sense. You should you should be better than this by now, <laughs> because my my stories, my writing process it tends, tends to get messier with each book. I said, this is ridiculous. You're supposed to be a professional. You actually get paid for these things. But it just, it just, it stumps me. I don't um, sit there and do nothing for too long. And I said, no, Rick's got a problem. Jump in. You'll find your way. That's the story of my life. That's, that's exactly <laughs> how I write. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think sometimes students say, do you want a clear process? I'm so, I feel like so often it's about getting comfortable with it. Yes. I like that. Um, I'm using it. It's, Oh, yeah, yeah, get comfortable with it. Publish it when it's a mess, see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> then you make it really comfortable. So, Matt, how do you like to be found, or do you? Do you like hang out on social media, um, Where you know, website? Uh, where do you like people to go? Yeah, my, my website is mattcoilbooks.com, and I, I am on Facebook quite a bit. This is the time of year when book coming out that you're, you know, you're talking a little more about your work than you maybe should, but people understand. Um, Facebook's about the only one I know how to work. I'm, Instagram, I can kind of uh, like stuff and occasionally post something. It takes me a while to figure out. Um, X or whatever it's called now, um, I can like things. and for, I think I can forward things, yeah. <laughs> but Instagram, I'm pretty, I'm not to say prolific, but I'm there often and um, I, for a while there, I, I lost my yellow lab last, a year ago, a little over a year ago. And he, he was better known than me for doing his couch yoga sleeping. He'd be upside down sleeping on the couch. And I'd take that picture every day, and people really liked it. So um, then they're, now they're just stuck with me for the time being. Yeah, or you're going to have to lay on your couch. <laughs> you have to do your own <laughs> do your yoga. Own, do your own yoga on the couch and take pictures, you know. Get you on TikTok. My pull a muscle. No, I stay away from, I stay away from <laughs> TikTok, that's for sure. Well, we appreciate you being on. It's been a great, great conversation. And, of course, your new book, The Odyssey's End. It's a Rick Cahill series, book 10. Matt Coyle, thank you for coming on the show. And thanks a lot for having me. It was a lot of fun. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. Good night. This is Peter Production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.